Hello, everyone. Well, it's been a while since I've actually talked about new stories in biomedical science, uh, but I've finally been able to organize our lives in this uh, age of COVID to resume something that resembles something normal <laughs> after uh, moving to our new apartment here in Philly. Um, and particularly since it looks like I'm likely going to be starting a new job in a little under a month, um, I really wanted to have just a bit more fun doing this before I have to readapt to do that. <laughs> um, so uh, something I discussed a few weeks back was the prospect that COVID-19 might have some neurological symptoms. Um, it was, uh, and, and continues to be, a, a complicated story that's still not entirely clear, but suffice it to say that it seems some people develop rather severe neurological symptoms to the virus, while others develop like exclusively respiratory symptoms. Um, after all, it is thought to be principally a respiratory virus or, of course, like mild or negligible symptoms um, after being exposed. Well, uh, a group at Co in Copenhagen um, published a review in a scientific journal called Brain Behavior and Immunity, appropriately, uh, regarding uh, the prevalence of mood-related psychiatric conditions following infection with SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes uh, COVID-19. And so the group reviewed 43 publications on the topic, and they were trying to assess the mental health consequences of the virus um, spread between like both patients as well as like clinicians, um, people who are caring for the patients. Um, and so, you know, unsurprisingly, the study found substantial signs of psychiatric distress among clinicians who are managing patients. Um, and there are evidently only two studies that evaluated psychiatric symptoms among patients with COVID-19. Those studies did find increased incidences of mood-related psychiatric conditions um, among like recovered COVID-19 patients. Um, but given that there's been suspicion of a potential neurological effect of the virus uh, on the nervous system for several months now, I'm certainly hoping that more studies will be conducted to assess a few things. So first, is there a biological mechanism here? Are viral particles found in the CNS of our central nervous system of patients who died following infection with the virus? And then second, are there certain people who may be uniquely vulnerable to ne uh, the neurological consequences of being infected with the virus? Could it be something like blood type group, something we've talked about in the past? Could there be some other genetic vulnerability? And so um, if you're interested, I discuss some of the sources of evidence for neurological consequences of COVID-19 on April 5th. So the evidence that had been collected up until um, April 5th on, on YouTube. Um, but it doesn't seem that there's been that much more uh, elucidated about this potential nervous system interaction. Uh, though there's, there's been um, ongoing discussion of like this lingering suspicion that there seems to be neurological consequences in at least some of the patients following infection. Overall, though, it, it's, definitely gonna, it's definitely worth acknowledging that there's almost certainly going to be a psychiatric toll that this pandemic will take on everyone touched by the virus, both directly or indirectly. And, you know, it'll be prudent to anticipate and prepare for that psychiatric burden. On that note, um, the, the note of potential neurological consequences of infection with the virus, um, there's a study out of Gothenburg in, in Sweden. Um, a group collected some data that suggest that there may be detectable signs of effects of infection in the brain, like measurable. Um, and so uh, the group evaluated blood samples of 47 patients with either mild, moderate, or severe symptoms of COVID-19 while at the hospital. And so they measured levels of specific bio, uh, uh, biochemicals um, that are typically used as like indicators of damage of the central nervous system. and. Um, and then compared those levels to nearly as many people who were just healthy and similar in age and sex, right, as controls. And, you know, before I get like too far into this study, um, we have to talk about one initialism, it wouldn't be neuroscience without a bunch of initialisms, and this one is NFL. Uh, and it's a particularly convenient uh, uh, initialism for my fellow Americans. Uh, and so for the purposes of, of this conversation, NFL stands for neurofilament light chain protein. So just think like neurofilament light, because <laughs> there's, you know, heavy, medium, light. Um, and, you know, so, so yeah, the, like literally this is a, for, a part of the protein um, that's opposed to, you know, uh, medium or heavy. So NFL is referring to specifically to the light part of neurofilament proteins. And, you know, it's not really worth getting into like what they are, what NFL does. 
Um, but it's worth noting that this specific thing that's detectable in the blood, you just get a blood test, um, has been identified as a way to evaluate everything from like multiple sclerosis to brain injury um, when a person comes into the hospital with symptoms uh, that you know make a physician think that there may be something going wrong in a person's nervous system. And so um, these things that we measure are called biomarkers, uh, meaning like these are specific molecules that can be measured in things like blood, not only blood, but um, that's one of the, the easiest places to measure them. And they can give physicians an idea of what's going on in someone's body. And so like physicians use bio, uh, biomarkers to get a sense of like how someone's or other organs are doing, like, you know, kidneys or, or the liver, because certain molecules are only elevated in the blood when something's going wrong with those organs. Same idea here. This particular molecule, NFL, seems to correlate nicely with just stuff going awry in the nervous system. And so this group um, decided to see if there were changes in, in levels of this molecule. NFL, um, in people who came down with COVID-19 and, and ended up in the hospital. And so this wasn't the only molecule that they measured. Um, so they also checked out um, something called GFAP, which is just another similar kind of sign that something undesirable may be happening in the nervous system when it's um, elevated. And so basically, the group set out to see if they could to see if people who are infected with the virus tend to have higher or lower levels of, um, of these biomarkers in the blood and to see if those changes in levels was associated specifically with mild, moderate, or severe reactions to the virus. Um, so uh, Henrik Zetterberg, I might be mispronouncing that, but he, he's a, a professor of neurochemistry, um, said uh, the following about the study, so quote, uh, the increase in NFL levels in particular over time is greater than we've seen previously in studies connected with intensive care, and this suggests that COVID-19 can in fact directly bring about brain injury. Whether it's the virus or the immune system that's causing this is unclear at, this, uh, at, at present, um, and more research is needed. Okay, so, so basically the group is suggesting that people experiencing moderate and severe uh, reactions to COVID-19 tended to exhibit signs of just sort of negative nervous system reactions to the virus. Um, how it is that the virus elicits those reactions remains unclear. And so um, uh, Zetterberg, Dr. Zetterberg noted that it could just as easily be our, our, our own immune systems like going into hyperdrive, you know, and, and sort of like just carpet bombing our own bodies uh, to attack cells infected with the virus, um, you know, rather, rather than just like the virus itself. So rather than like, like attacking specific cells that were infected with, with the virus and causing them specifically to deteriorate. And, you know, it, it probably seems a little ridiculous that we can suffer severe reactions to a virus that are due to our own immune systems and not directly to the virus itself. Um, and that's why I, I use that metaphor of carpet bombing. So instead of like taking out a specific target, um, the, the immune system just attacks entire areas of the body, damaging cells that haven't even in, interacted with the virus because, you know, the immune system just hasn't developed a way to recognize only the cells that are infected with the virus. So, so you know, once again, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that uh, neuroimmunologists are, are currently uh, assessing if this virus has like a, a unique way to gain access to the nervous system. And if it does, if there's an explanation of why it is that only some people exhibit this reaction to infection. Or, you know, alternatively, if there are some people who have like unique genetic traits, like genetic traits that are identifiable, um, that cause their immune systems to go especially, you know, buck wild <laughs> and attack the nervous system uh, tissue following infection with the virus, while other people have barely any reaction at all. Or, finally, uh, if this difference in how people react to the virus um, might be explained by some people having been exposed to, you know, viruses that are similar enough to, to SARS-CoV-2, the, the virus that causes COVID-19 that they have far more specific immune system reactions. And so in other words, if they've been infected by like a cousin of the virus, um, you know, maybe that enables pe people's immune systems to not have to react with like carpet bombing because their immune systems know pretty much what to look for. All right, um, there's, there's just this one thing, um, okay, new topic. And <laughs> this is like one thing that's been bugging me over the past few weeks. Um, and I've just kind of been like observing how progress within biomedical science uh, regarding COVID-19 has been communicated to folks outside of the discipline. And so it has to do with like how there have been a lot of, of articles that cover articles in the popular press that cover preprint articles, meaning a compilation of experiments um, 
perform to understand you know the nature of this novel coronavirus that haven't yet undergone peer review so um, these articles are typically the articles for the popular press are typically published in, in outlets like The Conversation is one, or, or like, you know, legacy media outlets, um, which means that people who don't necessarily appreciate the difference between a peer-reviewed, you know, scientific publication and one that hasn't gone through the process, they're exposed to scientific arguments that haven't been evaluated or improved by the scrutiny of other scientists in, in, in a relevant field. Right. That's basically the, the purpose of, of peer review. And so, that you know, this isn't necessarily like a problem within science, though it, it's still not a, not exactly ideal. But, you know, in my personal opinion, preprint repositories uh, like BioArchive is one are um, fantastic and, and they expedite innovation within science. Right. Um, and I'm almost certainly going to be submitting a preprint article in the very near future. Um, but. When someone reads an article that interprets findings in a pre-print uh, article, meaning you know they they publish their perspectives in an online media outlet intended for folks outside of science, that nuance in the meaning of the findings published in a pre-print reviewed uh, uh, or pre-peer reviewed um, studies, it's almost always neglected, right? They they don't like you know strongly caveat that uh, this is this is yet to be peer reviewed. And so, like, as a result, I had, like, a minimum of, like, five people I know send me an article about the novel coronavirus being a combination of two viruses, um, and all, or a chimera uh, is sometimes uh, a word that was used, and so all of these were based on some pre-peer-reviewed publications that were um, submitted, and, you know, to be clear, there may be some issues with, with how we ought to interpret those papers, um, you know, not the least of which being that these labs evidently aren't being entirely transparent about the genetic sequences they were using to, to assess this question. Um, and, you know, to be sure, this is not a sign of scientific misconduct or, or anything like that. But, you know, it's, it's peer review that enables other virologists and geneticists and so on to scrutinize those genetic sequences to evaluate just how confident we ought to be in the claims about this, you know, chimera theory, combination theory of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and once again, that, that's the virus that causes COVID-19, which is, you know, driving the pandemic. Um, and uh, even things as simple as like the prospect of the original samples that were used to define the genetic sequences of the virus might be as simple as them being uh, contaminated. Um, and, you know, that possibility needs to be scrutinized by fellow scientists. That's what peer review is for. And so, you know, what I mean is like these labs are making suggestions about the origin of the virus based on like genetic analyses of the sequences of the virus that were collected from specific sources. Um, and so one potential problem with these papers is, you know, what if the samples that were collected from things like, you know, the early patients who were exhibiting symptoms of what would ultimately be identified as um, COVID-19 or from like pangolins, you know, one of the uh, uh, animals that thought to have harbored the virus before it spread to humans. What if they were handled by people who were themselves infected with SARS-CoV-2? So, you know, what if these analyses would be conducted on samples that were contaminated by the people who were handling them from the beginning? That had changed the conclusions to which we'd come, given, you know, the experiments that they conducted. Um, and by the way, so the, the findings I'm discussing were studies that suggested that it may be the case that a pangolin, oh, which uh, in case you're unfamiliar with what this really strange and really cool animal looks like, it looks like this. Uh, it looks sort of like like a very fancy armadillo <laughs> or like if an armadillo and a dragon made it or something a uh, really cool animal um and so you know so 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 there, there might have been simultaneous infection of a pangolin or group of pangolins with two viruses and due to their simultaneous presence within the same animal those viruses in the animal uh, might have interacted to produce the novel virus with which we're currently you know confronted um, and this is an interaction between coronaviruses that has been known to happen, right? They don't uh, rapidly evolve and, and change, you know, similar to uh, like how the influenza virus does. It causes the flu, uh, but they can recombine. They can sort of uh, combine forces <laughs> uh, when they're in the same uh, biological system. And so um, these are the kind of studies that, that would take a fair bit more time to be published before they'd be discussed in the types of, you know, public uh, popular press outlets you know, so that folks outside of the, of the discipline can read them. And so, you know, when I say like a fair bit more time, by the way, I mean like many months to even several years before they'd hit the popular press. I mean, some studies literally take year over, you know, over five years, six, seven years to publish. Um, and so, you know, I think that it, it may not be entirely prudent to 
run with these kinds of you know preprint studies in these types of popular press media outlets. That, that's all. Um, all right, and, and I'm sure like everybody's totally sick about hearing about this this virus, uh, but you know I've received more than a few questions about the potential effect on the nervous system um, that COVID-19 might have, um, and so you know I just thought it might be worth uh, discussing given that this this story like almost literally just came out, um, and and you know the the uh, developments in in potential neurological consequences. Um, you know there haven't been that many studies on that, and, and these uh, handful of studies uh, recently came out, so I thought I'd discuss it. All right. Um, why don't we start the live half and uh, we can say goodbye to the pangolin. All right. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> my name is Ian McLaughlin and I'm a neuroscientist. I wrapped up my PhD in neuroscience at the University of Pennsylvania at the end of last year. And I just talked about uh, a few discussions of potential neurological repercussions of COVID-19 on, on YouTube. And you can check out by searching for things like Ian Anthropoid or and you know if Anthropoid isn't particularly familiar word, uh, uh, you can try spelling, find the spelling in like my Twitter handle or Periscope handle um, if you'd like to hear about those studies, about the neuro potential neuro neurological consequences of COVID-19. Okay, so I hope all of you are doing well. Happy Father's Day, everybody. Happy Father's Day to my, you know, uh, a tribe of fellow fathers. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember that there is a, a question about a potential relationship between um, aspartame and headaches. And, you know, while I suspected that there could be a relationship there, um, I, I was unsure as to whether there, there was any evidence to back that up. And so I poked around and discovered that, yes, there's a known relationship there. Um, an article that was published in the journal Headache, appropriately, uh, identifies that, that aspartame as early as like 1989 was identified as a potential dietary source of headache. Um, and so, you know, another study about five years later also provides some evidence that there's a possible relationship there. Um, and while, you know, this first study was just uh, observational, this study, the second study was a double blind crossover um, with uh, people who ident self identified as having like headaches following exposure to aspartame. And so, you know, the results of the study weren't like very thoroughly conclusive, um, but th there was some evidence that for people who were very sure that they suffered headaches following exposure to aspartame, they, there were some folks who also reported having headaches under controlled conditions. Um, and so, um, meaning that we can be a bit more confident about, um, about that claim. Uh, and so, you know, these researchers, all of whom are at the um, University of Washington, uh, suggest that there, there may be some people who, who are particularly susceptible to um, aspartame-induced headaches. Um, and there, you know, there are like other publications uh, throughout the, the 80s and the 90s about like just the, the types of complaints that the FDA would, would and CDC uh, received uh, regarding aspartame. Um, and uh, the most common complaint was headache. Um, and so, you know, these were completely uncontrolled reports, of course, right? They're just people saying, hey, I'm having a headache and I had this aspartame, uh, just FYI. <laughs> um, but it doesn't mean that these data are meaningless, right? Uh, these reports are still, you know, useful uh, um, data. Um, all right, let's see, was there anything else? Oh yeah, other studies um, I, I should note have um, uh, indicated that there's no relationship between aspartame and, and headache, um, but, uh, you know, that, that's how these things go in biomedical science. Um, and, and what's kind of frustrating for me is that, like, despite how ubiquitous aspartame is, I mean, try and find, like, a diet beverage that doesn't have aspartame. I haven't been able to find a, a convincing biological mechanism as to, like, why a headache would arise from aspartame. Um, and I've seen, like, some attempts to explain it, but, I mean, take it from me, they're, they're overly broad and, and clearly just speculation. Um, so, all this to say, if you get headaches, uh, you notice you get headaches after uh, consuming aspartame, but you don't consume it. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, there's another um, uh, question about like the relationship between the head trauma and NMA um, and it like independently of concussion. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that if anybody's uh, interested. Interesting study like just came out about that. Um, all right, let's see how to detox the brain lymph system. Um, hi, Chris, girlfriend here. She has been waiting on you. <laughs> uh, well, so when you say detox the, the brain lymph system, lymphatic system, I mean, so the lymphatic system, the brain doesn't really have the same kind of lymphatic system that you probably have in mind. So the, the lymphatic system is essentially in the periphery um, and it is the sort of conduit for things like antibodies. Um, it's like a separate circulatory system almost. It's very cool. Um, and the brain has something that we call the glymphatic system, uh, which is sort of functions similarly, but you know, we don't have really B, B cells and C cells 
B cells and T cells uh, in the brain. We have like microglia and you know other sort of similar types of cells that, that behave that way or that, that have sort of like phagocytic properties that can like engulf something that's not supposed to be there. Um, but you know broadly speaking, you know you, you wouldn't they're not equivalent systems. Also when, when you say like detox, um, you know that's a word that is sort of thrown around a lot um, you know like detoxing your system, uh, you know getting rid of toxins. The problem with the way I hear that, discussed is that like people have a really difficult time identifying what exactly a toxin is um, and and generally speaking I, you know I, more often than not what I see is that when people start you know saying you know this is toxic um, they're they're sort of speculating and, and it's sort of like well, well it's not natural that's one of the things that, that comes up well lead is natural you know and, and lead is certainly not ideal to have in your nervous system um, and so uh, you know, detoxing, I think, is, is sort of a, an overly broad um, descriptor. Um, the best thing you can do when it comes to, like, amplifying the efficacy of your glymphatic system, your brain's sort of immune system, is get a lot of sleep. <laughs> or, you know, get an appropriate uh, duration of sleep. That system, the glymphatic system, is significantly more active when we're asleep than when we're awake. So, um, you know, if you are at a sleep deficit, um, it is going to be less effective, le less um, active. Um, in fact, one of the uh, hypotheses for Alzheimer's disease is that um, chronic sleep deprivation, which is known to be associated with increased um, incidences of dementia, uh, you know, a, a sleep deficit uh, sort of disables the lymphatic system, and then as a result, the two aggregates that are sort of the signatures of um, Alzheimer's disease, amyloid beta plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, are able to aggregate or build up uh, more rapidly than they would had the person been getting a good amount of sleep. Um, so that would be the number one thing. Just uh, don't um, don't skip on that sleep. Hey, Asha, good to see you. Asha Vellani. Why isn't anyone protesting today? Do all their brains have to spend time with their fathers? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, maybe. Um, all right. Actually, I, I think I did see... Um, I think I did see a group of people um, walking down the or uh, biking down the parkway. I don't know if they were that was a protest. It might have just been like a dad bike trip or something. But um, I mean, MD. No, I'm a PhD, so I'm a scientist, not a phys not a physician. Um, any insight on dreaming? How uh, meaningful are they to real life or just subconscious thoughts? Excellent question. And in fact, if you would um, like a deep dive into de uh, dreaming, I have a podcast. It's called Wired to Be Weird, and we um, talked about dreaming quite a bit more than I anticipated because once I started doing a literature review, meaning like I dive into the sort of evidence that's been collected by scientists, I found that it's, it's a far more interesting topic than I anticipated. Um, so like to address the, the, the first topic, like how uh, meaningful are dreams? You know, should we be interpreting, you know, it, are dreams... Um, our subconscious trying to teach us a message, our, our conscious awareness a message. There's really no good evidence for that. Um, and in fact, you know, we're not 100% sure why dreaming occurs, um, but we have some pieces of evidence and, and here are some of them. So, so first of all, we think that most dreaming occurs during a, a phase of sleep called REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. We, uh, you know, as you're falling asleep and staying asleep, you have sort of different stages of sleep. Um, and it's basically a progression of like stage one to three. And then some people say maybe four, a, a fourth stage. Some people say three and four, are basically the same. doesn't matter. You have, you have several stages. And as you progress through those stages, your brain is getting slower and more rhythmic. And in fact, we refer to that kind of sleep as slow wave activity. So SWA sleep. Um, it's very important uh, uh, phase of sleep. Um, but then we enter into REM sleep just after stage three slash four, uh, and the brain becomes significantly more active. And in fact, it almost resembles the patterns of activity that we see when people are awake, um, with one very important, or with a few very important exceptions, but one most important exception is that activity in the frontal regions, prefrontal cortex, is significantly lower than, um, than uh, when you're awake. Um, and in fact, one of the theories for why we, ha why we, we can have lucid dreams is that the frontal uh, lobes become significantly more active for some reason while somebody's still in REM sleep and then therefore all of the capabilities that the frontal lobes um, give us are become available when, when you're dreaming and so you can sort of more effectively scrutinize the, the progression of your dream like wait a second can I really breathe underwater and when you realize that you can't but you are then you can all of a sudden you know engage your dream in a, in a more meaningful way 
Um, okay, so like, why do we dream? Um, so again, you know, we think that most dreams that we remember at least occur during that REM phase. Well, believe it or not, um, actually, maybe I should. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Let, let me ask. So, do um, any of you have a guess as to during the sort of full life cycle of a human, um, when we have the greatest proportion of REM sleep? Does anybody have an idea? Um, oh, you do lucid dream. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, well. I wouldn't expect you to know this because I actually didn't learn this when I was in college. I learned this during a, um, a literature review for a podcast on dreams, and that is actually when towards the end, the last, uh, I think the last trimester, when you're still in the womb. Um, and so obviously you're not conscious or anything like that, um, but that does suggest that that um, you know phase of or that pattern of brain activity plays some role that's important in the development of the human brain. Um, and that is interesting that it happens then. Um, and by the way, that the patterns of, of REM type activity in the womb, it's not identical, right? But um, you know, similar patterns. And so perhaps that is an indication of what REM sleep does for us post birth. Um, either maybe it plays, it's the only reason that we do it is that it plays a role in orchestrating um, uh, the, this development of the brain. And then once, the brain is essentially done growing, which, by the way, takes a while. Uh, you know, anybody that's under 24 years old, maybe 26 years old, still hasn't had their prefrontal cortex fully uh, uh, developed. So it takes a while. And so maybe, you know, once we're outside of the womb, there's still some work to be done in the development of the brain. And so REM sleep may play an important role there. There's other theory. And, and then, you know, once the brain, once it's done developing, there's really no selective pressure. There's no reason that you are you would be more likely to reproduce if you stopped having REM sleep. And so there's just been no selective pressure to stop REM sleep. Um, however, I think, I think the sort of prevailing theory as to why we have dreams, why we have REM sleep is that it plays an important role in sort of um, fostering new learning, essentially fostering learning and memory. Um, and so just because, you know, if there's activity that's going on in the brain, uh, the brain is going to do what it, what it always does, which is like sort of piece together some kind of coherence between all these, these random patterns of activity that occur just because, you know, the brain is automatically sort of strengthening what, what you've learned in, in the prior day. There are other lines of evidence I could go on and on, um, but it's a really interesting story. So if you're more interested in, in going deeper, either bring up another topic or, um, you know, check out the podcast. It's called Wired to be Weird. Um, all right. Oh, hey, Euro. You're a maestro. Good to see you, man. Um, all right. 5G towers don't have anything to do with coronavirus. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I saw this, this, somebody, oh, my mom sent me this video of a guy who I suppose is a physician. Um, you know, at least he calls himself Dr. Uh, well, I won't say his name. Um, in front of what appeared to be a class in Indiana. And he, it takes about five minutes for him to get there, but he sort of talks about the kind of biology of the virus and, and sort of what we know, and there's no problems there. It's a little, you know, superficial, but, but whatever, that's fine. And then with, after like five minutes, he goes directly into like 5G uh, driving this virus and uh, then rapidly goes into anti-vaccination. Um, it's become interesting to observe how these like conspiracy theories, and they are conspiracy theories, kind of have become bundled, where if you believe one of them, you're almost certainly um, adherent to the others. Um, anyways, you know, there, we, this virus has only been around for, for a short period of time. Uh, it's kind of remarkable how rapidly it's kind of, um, you know, given humans a, a run for our money. <laughs> uh, but it's also been amazing how rapidly we've learned about the basic biology of this virus, and we know a lot about its origins. You know, um, we know a lot about it because it's rather similar to prior coronaviruses that caused outbreaks, like the one that caused SARS. Um, it's, you know, somewhat similar to other coronaviruses, and it has some specific differences at a genetic level. Viruses are just a series of, of genes, you know, just a handful of genes. Um, and while this, you know, these, this coronavirus is, is fairly large for, for a virus of its type, um, it only has a couple. It has like 30,000 base pairs. Um, and so, um, uh, 
So we so you know we, we can we can learn about its origins by comparing it to other similar viruses. In fact, on YouTube, I talked about one theory that's kind of emerging from two recent studies um, that that you know suggested it may have arisen because one of the unique properties of coronaviruses is that they can recombine with each other. So most viruses. So I should say, you know, the virus with which you're probably the most familiar is the influenza virus, the virus that causes the flu, and it notoriously. Um, evolves, mutates fairly rapidly. Um, and that's why every year there's like a new strain of the flu and, and there are people whose jobs it is to uh, try and predict what the next flu strain is going to look like so that we can vaccinate for it. Um, so the coronavirus, this novel coronavirus, does not mutate and evolve nearly as rapidly as the influenza virus. Uh, because it has what's called proofreading capabilities. In other words, like if there's an issue, if something changes in the sequence, there is a component of the virus that will um, recognize that and, and correct it. Okay. Um, however, coronaviruses can do something called recombination. Once two slightly different coronaviruses are within the same uh, uh, biological structure, they can interact with each other, combine, and then generate a novel coronavirus. And so there's some evidence to support that that theory. Um, there's some problems with the study, and I talked about that on, on the YouTube um, video about it, uh, but, but it's interesting. I mean, it, it's certainly plausible. It's certainly more plausible than 5G towers. <laughs> uh, there's just no biological justification for um, jumping so far ahead into something like 5G towers to explain um, you know, uh, uh, something for which we have much simpler and more plausible explanations. If we had no idea, if this virus was completely dissimilar to any prior virus, if it, you know, had, had essentially nothing in common with prior viruses, okay, we might be in a different situation here and we could, you know, speculate as to like, maybe there are some non-biological, you know, uh, 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 sources for it or, or, or you know, causes uh, um, that exacerbate its spread, but we're just not there. We know plenty about this virus early on. Um, so, so yeah, um, far more plausible are the, you know, explanations that are based off of the actual biology of the virus. Okay. Um, uh, if this scientist were to say 5G towers harm our brains, the government will be knocking on his door. Uh, that's also not true. I don't think the government really cares very much about me. Um, okay. I have zero negative. O negative. Oh, the virus won't hurt me. So, you know, that, that is, uh, <laughs> that is a zero, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so O negative is a blood, to, uh, blood type group or blood group type. Um, and, you know, you, most of you have probably heard of, oh, I'm a type A or, you know, type B, type AB, <laughs> type O, type uh, o positive, O negative. Um, those are called blood uh, group types or blood type groups. And basically they are a function of little kind of like flags that are unique uh, among certain groups of people that distinguish their blood cells from other blood cells, uh, other people's blood cells. Um, and the, the blood uh, group that you, um, of which you're a part is determined by the genes that you inherit from your uh, mother and your father. Um, and so there has been some evidence, to get to the point that our friend here was, was bringing up, there have been some data that do suggest that this uh, virus um, and other similar coronaviruses may exhibit a kind of discrimination based off of blood group type. Um, and so... Um, uh, and but those data are basically entirely just statistical. So it, it's just like, you know, a certain uh, uh, you know a, a group in a hospital. I think the first study came out of China. Uh, will just begin. You know, the, they'll collect data on everything about people that are coming in to try and understand the virus. And one of the things that they would collect is is uh, blood antigen type. You know, type A, type B, blah blah blah. Um, and uh, However, you know, it's not a controlled study. It's purely observational. They're just saying, hey, it turns out that generally speaking, the majority of people who have this virus, who have severe reactions to this virus, tend to be of this blood uh, antigen type. Um, and so, you know, that, that's meaningful. Um, and they, they, this was observed after the, the initial SARS outbreak in the early 2000s. Um, and so, you know, it wouldn't be extraordinary. Also, it wouldn't be the only virus that would exhibit this kind of discrimination. Nor the norovirus also sort of notoriously exhibits this kind of discrimination in severity of reaction or even uh, susceptibility to being infected based off of blood antigen type. So um, it's, it's possible, uh, and, and particularly that, you know, some other lines of evidence, you know, arise from the fact that some people develop very severe circulatory system reactions to infection with the virus. So um, uh, it's certainly plausible, uh, but 
you know, I should note that it's not like those data, even if we were to say, okay, let's just accept, let's stipulate that the, that the blood antigen type theory is correct. None of the data on which you'd be um, basing that, that, that assertion are like 100% categorically, if you have a certain blood type group, you will not get infected. And if you do get infected, it won't be severe. It's more statistical probabilities. Um, purely based off of what they observed, right? They didn't conduct an, an experiment to determine whether or not this was a viable explanation. So I, I definitely would not advise anybody who, you know, uh, knows that you're a certain blood group type uh, to be super confident that you're just like totally okay. Um, definitely the, the data are not strong enough for that. Um, it is an interesting, um, also if true, it would mean less risk for type O for both incidence and severity and, and more risk for type A. Uh, but not zero risk. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you think uh, vaccines will be available later this year? No. Uh, I mean, it, it's, you know, never say never, right? But um, it, it would be a, a very, very remarkable achievement if um, an effective, um, you know, vaccine were not only created, but also, you know, tested and found to be safe enough for general consumption. Because if you think about if a, if a vaccine comes out, there will be millions and millions of people who are vaccinated. Um, and as you know, anybody who does anything related to biomedical science knows, vaccines in particular have been targeted for any incidents in, in you know, past vaccination that had negative health consequences. And that's fair. I mean, like everything should be scrutinized for potential negative health consequences. It's why we have an FDA. Um, but but particularly given that we're talking about vaccines, it will be so critical to ensure that whatever vaccine shows promise is, you know, as confidently as we can be safe for everyone. Um, and, you know, keep in mind that includes people with, you know, other medical conditions, maybe, you know, uh, young children. And so, you know, these are all really, really difficult to nail down. You know, biomedical science is a very messy and difficult um, discipline. And so uh, it would be remarkable. Now, you know, that said, um, vaccine technology has advanced quite a bit since, you know, since like most vaccines were created. Uh, and in fact, there's a company right outside of Philadelphia, I always forget its name, but they ha um, have a technology that enables them to produce vaccines based purely on genetic sequences. Um, and so it's, you know, a little bit more sort of sophisticated than the, the typical way that vaccines are created. And it, it would also be far more, more rapid. Um, but we've never used a vaccine based on or, or that emerged from this kind of technology. So, you know, it, it, it's tough to, to know, but um, it would be really, really remarkable. It would be Nobel Prize worthy if a group comes out uh, with a, a vaccine that rapidly. Um, I am more um, optimistic that we will find some, you know, some treatment, some antiviral small molecule, a drug in other words, that just renders treatment of COVID-19 far more effective reduces, you know, hospital stays, um, reduces the severity, uh, reduces the, the likelihood of intubate or of um, having to use a, a ventilator. Um, and, you know, there was some, pro that whenever you hear, you hear people talk about like remdesivir um, or early on, earlier on, it was um, hydroxychloroquine. Um, that's what we're talking, that, or that's what is being discussed. It's like, it's not a vaccine. It's just a molecule that enables people people to be more likely to, to survive uh, infection. Um, yeah, there's a new one. I think it's dexamethasone uh, has been showing some promise. Um, another convenient uh, strategy is to focus on drugs that we already know are safe in most people. Um, so that, that was the case with hydroxychloroquine, although, you know, that was definitely exaggerated just how safe it, it was. But, um, you know, physicians are familiar with it and, and they know what to expect and uh, they know who, who's at risk and stuff. And so um, that is one advantage of being able to use something that's already been FDA approved because you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, the, the, there's no reason to um, anticipate that any established drug will be super effective for, for COVID-19. But that would be a faster um, uh, tool uh, in, the, in the sort of, in the armamentarium of physicians, uh, one of my favorite words. Armamentarium just means like, you know, that like uh, carpenters have tools like hammers and screwdrivers and belt sanders and stuff like that. Physicians have their armamentarium, <laughs> drugs, uh, you know, treatment protocol, um, that kind of stuff. All right. It, do we really only use 10% of our brain? Is there a way to unlock it all? Great question. It's kind of interesting because, um, and then we can talk about LSD. That would be fun. Um, 
it seems that that question has been coming up a lot more frequently in the recent past. It stopped coming up for a while. I wonder if there's some reason for that. But so the short answer is no, that, that is just not true. Um, we are not uh, restricted to any percentage of real estate within the brain. Um, the only limitation is, is the threshold beyond which if we were to use more brain activity at one time beyond this level, we would start having seizures. Um, so, you know, the, the percentage of, of brain that's active at any one time is dynamic. It's changing millisecond to millisecond, quite literally. Um, and also, by the way, um, enhanced performance. Like, I totally get it. You know, if some brain activity is good, a lot would be better, right? It totally makes sense. Um, but it's just not true. So, you know, if, if the goal is to, in, you know, amplify performance, to, to be the best you you can be, right, to take a, a standardized test or have to give a speech or go in for a job interview or learn how to play the piano, um, enhanced performance on that is actually not going to come from more brain activity. In fact, more brain activity is probably going to make it more challenging to accomplish those tasks. Think about it this way. Uh, well, I guess I used this metaphor last time, but... It's, it's the only one that I have right now. So, uh, you know, imagine we're trying to have this conversation right here, you and me. Um, and, uh, you know, we're sitting in a, in a room like one of our favorite bars in Philadelphia, and we're having a conversation about do we only use 10% of our brain? Um, and imagine if it's just you and just me sitting in that bar having that conversation. We can have a really good, coherent, effective conversation because we can hear each other, we can see each other, and so on. Now imagine that there's an Eagles game going on and there are just hundreds of people in the room shouting, getting in front of us. We can't quite see each other, can't even hear each other. That's what it would be like if, you know, you just turned up the volume on more brain activity. In fact, performance almost certainly is a byproduct of just honing in on just the minimal necessary brain activity. All right. Uh, we have a call. Uh, what's your name and where are you calling from? Are you there? Uh, Hoss, Hose Marty's. Uh, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from? I'm from Mabyville, South Carolina. Very nice. Uh, so what's on your mind? <laughs> I'm just more or less listening now to, to see what your line of conversation is about. Then I may have a question. All right. Well, I mean, it's it, you know anything. So I'm. I'm Neuroscientist, I, I study the brain, so anything that, that comes to mind, yeah, just call in. Uh, I'd love to talk to you. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, my nephew asks, why is this happening? Um, I tell him it happens every hundred years. Uh, why is this happening? I, I assume you mean why is the, the, um, the, the outbreak happening? Yeah, so you're right. Um, and in fact, it happens even more rapidly than that. So you uh, very astutely are referring to the Spanish flu outbreak or the, the pa uh, pandemic of 1918-ish. You know, <laughs> um, and that also fa followed a pretty interesting trajectory. Um, there was, a, well, in, in any case, yeah, so yeah, so about 100 years ago, right? And it was very, very severe. Uh, millions of people globally died. Um, in fact, Philadelphia was essentially the epicenter of that outbreak, by the way. Um, and that's because the city didn't impose uh, effective social distancing uh, practices like other cities, like St. Louis is always the one to which Philadelphia back then is compared because they did and they suffered far, far fewer um, fatalities. Um, but so, so you know, that was a, a strain of the flu, right? And there's some really interesting history as to why it came about then, that, like the role that, that World War I played. Um, and, um, you know, why it was that it, it's the, the most common fatalities from that pandemic were actually younger people. Um, interesting potential explanations there. I think my favorite potential explanation of why, why it would be that younger people uh, would succumb to the virus more regularly is that there was a prior outbreak that had happened, you know, years or I think actually, yeah, a few years prior that was similar enough, a virus that was similar enough to the Spanish flu um, influenza strain that people who were exposed back then, who would then have tend to be a little bit more elderly once the Spanish flu outbreak happened, they would have a sufficient immune system reaction to, to, to fight off the virus, whereas younger people just weren't even around to be exposed. Interesting uh, potential explanation. Um, there are other potential explanations too, but that one's, I think, good. So you're right. So that happened about 100 years ago. And hey, here we are, 2020, uh, or actually 2019 is when it started, almost exactly. Um, but we actually know that there were coronavirus outbreaks 
basically once every for the past like three decades. So there was, you know, the SARS outbreak uh, in the early 2000s. It was a very similar coronavirus. In fact, you know, it's quite, it's sort of called like SARS-CoV-1, uh, whereas this one is similar enough that our current one um, that we that it's called SARS-CoV-2. It's that similar. Um, and but then, you know, in the, just about 10 years later, there was a, another coronavirus outbreak, uh, MERS, uh, which was essentially just because um, a lot of the focus was in the Middle East. Um, and now here we are 10 years later. So it seems that there is this kind of cyclical quality to the emergence of these coronaviruses um, that, you know, uh, just may be something for which we can prepare. Um, we now have three data points, you know, uh, and so, uh, so yeah. Now, you know, why it's happening? Why, why is it? Another interesting question that I've asked myself, that a lot of people have asked, is why is it so severe in the United States? Why are so many people uh, affected by this virus? So many more than I think anybody in biomedical science, me included for sure, so many more than we would have ever anticipated. And um, there's really no good, uh, there's no justifiable reason that this happened. Um, you know, the United States, from the perspective, you know, in the context of biomedical science, the United States has essentially the greatest number of resources, um, you know, the largest number of, you know, humans that are working on these questions, um, some of the greatest biomedical institutions in the world, arguably the best ones. <laughs> um, that's, you know, that's debatable, who cares really, but, you know, high, very, very high quality biomedical research goes on in the United States, um, a lot of expertise. Um, and in fact, we, we uh, people whose, whose job it is to prepare for pandemics, they anticipated this. So um, I'll leave it up to you as to why you think that, that um, we're dealing with this uh, in the way that we are and that so many people are suffering tragedies that, you know, should have been prevented. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah. Um, okay, why do I have crushes on people? Well, that's a great question. Um, in fact, I have a podcast called Wired to be Weird. Uh, it's on like iTunes and wherever fine podcasts are podcast. Um, and I have an episode about love. Uh, it's called Why Do Birds Suddenly Appear? <laughs> and uh, uh, 100 points to Gryffindor for anybody who can uh, tell me what strong that is. Um, um, and it, OK, so, so here's why. I mean, so humans are a social uh, uh, primate <laughs> most primates are uh and attraction is like one of the subconscious very primitive components of our consciousness that drives reproduction um that drives sort of mating behavior um now of course it's not exclusively the human brain is a very very complicated place and so it's not as simple as you just flip a switch and all of a sudden you're attracted to someone um but that is essentially why it's the invisible hand of natural selection pushing you to behave in a way that is perhaps objectively irrational um but um theoretically uh good for the species um now wh why is it that you feel attraction that's another interesting uh conversation um, you've probably, or you may, if you're interested in these topics, may have heard of the, uh, the hormone oxytocin. It's a rather important hormone. It's very cool. It does a lot of stuff. It's very important for social interaction. And um, that is associated with uh, attraction. Also, dopaminergic activity in a part of the brain called the VTA, a part of the brain that I've studied personally, uh, seems to be also elevated when around somebody to whom you're attracted. Um, all right, we have a caller. Uh, let's see the name. So 721. Uh, what's your name and where are you calling from? Are you there? 721. It froze up on me. I don't know oh. if you can hear me. But yes, I can hear you. I may drop down and just try and join back in because your video is frozen. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, that's too bad. I wonder if there's like a connection issue. There was a connection issue for me last time. Huh. Let me know if the video is misbehaving. Um, okay, on YouTube, hi Ian. Can you talk about what you've learned about the possible long-term uh, chronic health issues associated with surviving COVID-19 respiratory? Right. Yeah. So that that is like one of the one of the, the major concerns that I think a lot of people are underestimating. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people recover from COVID-19, and that's obviously fantastic. <laughs> um, uh, However, there is evidence of like a, a much longer lasting pathology that arises in uh, respiratory tissue that can take months, years uh, to resolve. 
Um, and of course, you know, your respiratory tissue is among the most important tissue in your body. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't seen any evidence as to why, like, the mechanism by which these longer lasting, let's just call them injuries, um, arise from COVID-19. Um, you know, one likely explanation is just this cytokine storm that, that is often discussed uh, following infection with COVID-19 or uh, SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19, meaning that your immune system is just carpet bombing the whole body because it has no specific targeted way to only target uh, cells that are infected with the virus. And so it just damages everything. Um, it's, it's actually pretty close to what exactly happens. <laughs> um, and, and so that might be, be part of the reason for why uh, SARS-CoV-2 induces this damage. Another is that it seems to be the case that um, SARS-CoV-2, uh, it, which uh, in, distinct from other respiratory viruses, it can cause both an, an upper respiratory and a lower respiratory illness, um, meaning that generally speaking, respiratory viruses are either upper or lower. Upper respiratory viruses tend to be easier to spread and they tend to be less severe. Lower respiratory viruses tend to be much more severe, um, but harder to spread. And it seems that um, SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, can be both, um, which might you know, explain both why it, it spreads so easily and two, why reactions are so severe. Um, and there's some interesting potential biology underlying that, like um, SARS-CoV-2 may be able to interact with a, with a wider repertoire of uh, uh, receptors throughout the entire body than other coronaviruses have been able to in the past. And so as a result, it's able to just spread in, you know, beyond the respiratory system far more easily. There are other interesting you know, um, examples of um, pathologies, like um, there are some really odd um, uh, vascular reactions. In fact, some, uh, there were some physician scientists in China that speculated that actually it, it is principally not a respiratory virus. It's like a clotting virus. It's a, a blood-borne uh, uh, virus. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that any consensus ha has arisen regarding that. Um, so, uh, uh, but, but yeah, uh, it, it just seems to be, uh, have, have evolved to be far more versatile of a virus than its uh, predecessors. Um, is it possible to cure any disease by the brain? Uh, I mean, yes. <laughs> I, well, sort of. So, not in the way that I think you're, you're, um, you're interested in. So, it's not like if you have, you know, pick a disease, if you have diabetes, um, or if you have, you know, COVID-19, <laughs> um, just, you know, um, engaging the challenge, um, <laughs> Uh, engaging those diseases uh, through, you know, changing your attitude, getting more sleep, just purely brain-based reactions, that is not going to be sufficient to confront these types of pathologies because those, those diseases arise from, you know, organ systems, cells with which the brain has very indirect relationships. Um, so, you know, if you want to cure diabetes, the problem lives in the pancreas. It doesn't live in the brain. That said, um, it is true that brain states uh, affect body states and vice versa. So, you know, uh, if you tend to be extremely pessimistic about the, out, the, the probable outcome of your disease, that will tend to be associated with poor um, uh, recovery. Um, and, you know, there's some really interesting psychology behind, um, like, how any, you know, potential uh, uh, neurobiological explanations for, like, the placebo effect, um, and stuff like that, but no, broadly speaking, if you have a disease that's outside of the brain, the, the first concern is to, um, you know, confront that disease at the level of its organ system that is principally affected. Um, yeah, but, you know, other things like if you're, chronic, if you're chronically stressed, uh, you know, significantly stressed, um, that can have an immunosuppressive effect. And so, um, you know, through um, chronically elevated levels of um, of cortisol, you know, glucocorticoids circulating through the body that um, inhibits immune system activity. That's why, for example, if you have like a rash or something like that, a physician might prescribe hydrocortisone cream. Um, it's very, very similar, and essentially uh, what it's doing is inhibiting that immune system reaction. Um, and so chronic stress can, and for, you know, the recovery or prevention of infection, um, having an effective immune system is, is pretty critical. So, yeah. Um, let's see, what's another? Um, uh, of, of course, you know, um, uh, insufficient sleep, 
very similar kind of, of an effect as, as chronic stress. So, but yeah, if you want to cure diabetes, you focus on the pancreas. <laughs> um, that's why de dexamethasone um, may be effective in severe cases. Right, exactly, exactly. Great, great, um, great uh, 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 comparison, right? Dexamethasone is just sort of like a broad immunosuppressive uh, agent. Um, what about allergies? Uh, I, I guess I'm not quite sure what you mean, like the, the relationship between the brain and allergies, or, I mean, that is essentially how you treat allergies, right? Allergies are just the immune system responding to some otherwise, you know, um, uh, uh, unthreatening uh, uh, molecule to which you're exposed. Um, and so you just kind of suppress that, that, um, that, uh, that reaction. Uh, what is your uh, view on report might affect CNS respiratory, might view on, on report, oh, COVID might affect the CNS respiratory response? Yeah, I mean, so um, there are lines of evidence that there could be some, um, hi, from Philadelphia, Brazil, um, that uh, there is some neurobiological ramification of being infected with SARS-CoV-2. There, there's like, there's several lines of evidence. I've actually talked about it now twice on, on the YouTube. You can find the YouTube um, by searching like anthropoid Ian, uh, or anthropoid brain or something like that. Um, and uh, that's what I talked about earlier today was um, some more evidence that there may be like a neurobiological reaction specifically to infection with the virus. So rather than like an indirect effect of having, you know, poor respiration, you know, insufficient oxygen delivery to the brain, those types of things that can happen when somebody has severe, severe pneumonia, um, that can have, you know, ramifications for, for neurobiological health. But um, uh, it might be, it, there's some evidence to suggest that uh, the virus induces a sort of inflammatory reaction in the brain on its own, um, which would, which could potentially um, explain some of, you know, some of the cases of people coming into the hospital who are confused or exhibiting, you know, uh, symptoms of dementia, but with no respiratory symptoms, no fever, who test positive for COVID-19. Um, you know, and there are other lines of evidence, so you can check that, those out at uh, the YouTube. So search like anthropoid. If you don't know how to spell anthropoid, because that's a weird word that nobody ever uses, <laughs> um, it's my handle on Periscope and on Twitter. So you can just copy paste. Um, so uh, nobody has died from COVID all by itself. All the people died, that they found would have died anyway. That, that's the, that, that is a misunderstanding of biomedical science. Um, and it's been kind of remarkable to see the, the types of people who make those claims. Like, I don't blame somebody outside of um, biomedical science for, you know, just sort of being like, wait a second, we're talking about people who have diabetes or who are obese or, or you know, whatever. Okay, I mean, it, you're kind of ma you're making a different point than you think you're making, <laughs> uh, because no, those people would not have died um, as early as they did uh, had they not been infected with COVID uh, with SARS-CoV-2. You know, had they not caught COVID-19. So, I mean, th that is a a like almost a category error. Um, also, I mean, you know, it also implies a perspective on disease in healthcare, which is if you have any chronic disease. You're gonna die. Who cares? You know, like we let's let's worry about the healthy people first, and then we'll worry about the people who are suffering. Let's make sure that we, you know, b uh, spray water on all the houses, all of the houses in the neighborhood, rather than the one that's on fire, right? Like it, it's just it doesn't actually make ethical sense. Now, if you have a, a totally different set of ethics, I mean, you could defend that if your perspective on healthcare is let the let the people who are suffering die because they're. Uh, you know, a disproportionate strain on our economy. They're just, you know, we're all uh, in a gigantic recession just because all these, you know, people who are going to die anyways are might get sick. If that, that could be your worldview and you could defend that, that argument if that is your belief. But if you don't actually believe that, uh, that, that is what you're implying that, you know, ah, these people would die anyway. So, you know, so who cares? No, that's not how we, that's not a society I want to live in. I, I have people personally that I care about deeply uh, who have these pre-existing medical conditions. And thank you, I would prefer that they not get this virus and die years earlier than they would otherwise. Um, okay. Uh, do you believe, oh wait, oh, Abyss, good to see you, man. Uh, bit anxious about what to expect from this year. Yeah, no kidding. Do you believe in extrasensory? What's the connection with the brain. So when you say extrasensory, I mean, you know, 
we, we do have, humans have far more like sensory systems than um, we sort of popularly appreciate, right? So, you know, behind, you know, the, 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 the five senses that you hear about a lot, we're, we're sensitive to gravity, we're sensitive to acceleration. Um, those are senses that, you know, we just don't really talk about. We're sensitive to um, uh, acid, <laughs> levels of acidity. Uh, we're sensitive to uh, a bunch of other things. So, um, so, so there's that, right? We have more senses than, than I think we appreciate. But when you say extrasensory, I mean, like, for example, when we communicate with one another, we obviously, for very good reason, focused primarily on the verbal component of that communication, right? The words that you're saying, that is how we convey thoughts to each other. And, you know, very, very thankful that we're, we are organisms that have that ability to communicate that efficiently at our disposal. But that's not the only way that we communicate. And in fact, a lot of communication occurs that that is totally nonverbal. Um, you know, as humans, we are particularly sensitive to eye movement, to facial expression, particularly facial expression around the eyes. Um, and that's totally nonverbal. There's also like the intonation of how you're saying words that, you know, beyond just like, if I said like, Hey, versus, Hey, you know, those are two totally different communications using exactly the same word. And I'm just modulating intonation. That's called prosodic communication. And that's a very important part of communication. In fact, some languages like really exploit that we care about intonation and stuff. Like if you've ever tried to, to learn Mandarin, one of the hardest things as an English speaker is that intonation of the words can completely change the meaning of words. So um, anyways, yeah. So, but when you say extrasensory, like, um, you know, so yes, we can communicate without speaking to one another, but there's not like, like a, um, a neurobiological substrate that like is a, an antenna or a, you know, um, that, that broadcasts certain communications independently of, um, you know, uh, uh, or above and beyond via some unique dedicated sensory system. At least there's no evidence. Um, Cantonese has even more tones than Mandarin. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. I, I've never, I've not been exposed to very much Cantonese. Um, you know, the vast majority of people from China to whom I've been exposed uh, speak, you know, Mandarin. Um, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll believe you, of course. Um, it, it, it's only an important issue when it affects you as an individual. People can be so selfish. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and I, I don't even blame people for that. Like, you know, our, our society does kind of function that way. Uh, you're, you're sort of, um, uh, you know, we're, you know, uh, so, so I, I can appreciate when people don't like, uh, or I can empathize or sympathize with people who don't like think through the sort of philosophical argument they're making, uh, particularly because it's not their job, right? Like they, they don't sit around, they're not like public health experts or they're not physicians. And so, you know, this happens to be one of the biggest, maybe the biggest in our lifetimes, um, incursion into our sort of day-to-day -day life. So, I mean, I, I get it that, that people, you know, are, are interested in, in approaching this from a different perspective. But, um, but what, what does frustrate me is when people who should know better um, compel other people um, who don't think about these things all the time to uh, adhere to that perspective. That, that's what's frustrating me. Okay. When people analyze everything, what's going on in a brain, it's an overload. Um, as a syntax, as a scientist, uh, do you believe in God? What is your view on religion? You know, like, so I used to talk about uh, my own personal beliefs uh, years ago. Um, but, um, you know, at, at this point, like, I am no more um, informed on religion, on spirituality, on theology than anyone else here. In fact, I am sure that there's somebody in here who is um, more fluent in, in these sorts of evaluations of, of different religions and spiritual traditions. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just stopped sort of talking about my own because you might as well just ask anybody else. Yeah, you might as well ask somebody, you know, uh, to whom you're close friends or something like that, um, that than me, you know. My expertise is in what goes on in the brain uh, after you're born and then uh, right before you die. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, uh, wait, what's going on here? Be wearing Antifa masks, like Antifa. Yeah. So what you're talking about there, I mean, you know, humans are pattern-seeking creatures. So our, our friend here is saying uh, is essentially implying that COVID-19 is is a mechanism by which Antifa uh, has you know justified being able to wear masks everywhere. Um, 
it's an interesting relationship there. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I, I can understand the pattern that you're forming, but humans are pattern-seeking organisms. Like we, one of our greatest capabilities is uh, perceiving patterns in nature and acting upon them. Um, and um, so, uh, uh, like, I think that there are so many other explanations for COVID-19 that are biological, that are genetic, that are, um, you know, immunological, that we just, it, it doesn't have to be the case that this is a fabricated, um, that, well, that, that it, it's far less pl plausible that this is a, a fabricated pandemic. Um, okay. What is the main difference between the human brain and an animal one? Well, I would uh, submit to you that we there is no difference because humans are ourselves animals. Um, but I know that's a cheeky kind of boring point. Um, so so the the thing that makes the human brain quintessentially human that that enables us to do all the things that humans can do above and beyond what other primates um, are, are capable of doing is this is a, a couple of things. But the main thing is. Um, this very swollen frontal uh, region of the brain um, came on, you know, that is among the most recent developments in the evolution of the human brain. There's also, however, we have a very, very thick neocortex. Um, so just to give you an example, uh, elephants have far more neurons in their brains than humans have. Um, far more. But I, I don't think that I have to work too hard to convince you that humans are more intelligent um, than, than animals, or that, than elephants. So, you know, if more neurons equated to more intelligence or better brain, or, you know, however you want to phrase it, then elephants ought to be more intelligent. Um, but there is one significant difference, which is humans have far more neurons in our neocortex. When I say neocortex, it's like the outermost layer of the brain than elephants do. So there could be, you know, some uh, secret sauce to the uh, to the the necessity of having or the to, the capabilities that uh, the neocortex confer to us, um, but yeah, so it's mostly those two things, um, and uh, you know there are essentially like if you were to sort of slice my brain you know in half right whatever like that or like that uh, do a nice old sagittal suction along the midline uh, basically a cut from here to here and then you were to look at it you like ha having you know essentially you know maybe you've been exposed to like oh I, I think that's the thalamus or you know I can you know see the, the wrinkles on the outside like I that's the cortex um, and you were to do the same with a bonobo brain or a chimpanzee brain you would see some similarities like you would see some of the structures are clearly pretty similar in fact maybe they're even close in size um, and in fact, as you go down the phylogenetic tree, as you go down to organisms that are evolutionarily significantly simpler, and um, you know, even all the way down to like rodents, they have a lot of the same brain structures that we have, but they're just significantly smaller, typically less complicated. Um, and so, so yeah, so, so there are tons of similarities across the entire animal kingdom um, in brain structures, but um, there are some pretty specific ones um, that render the human brain like uniquely capable of doing certain things that other animals can do to some extent, but not, not as effectively. Um, have you read any studies about receptor structures between rodents and humans, if any? Oh yeah, oh for sure, yeah, there, there are definitely some. Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot. Um, in fact, it's, it's, you know, that is an important um, thing. When you're studying something like nicotinic receptors, something that I studied, or dopamine receptors, and maybe you're using animal models, maybe you're trying to see if, you know, um, if cocaine is addictive under certain circumstances, you know, if the temperature is hot, is cocaine more or less addictive? Nobody would do that study. Maybe somebody has, but, um, you know, just think about that. And what you're trying to understand is, hey, in the summer, you know, when it's hotter out in some places, does cocaine consumption maybe go up or down, right? This is like a totally ridiculous experiment, but walk with, or work with me here. Um, and, you know, cocaine, the molecule is going to be identical, right? That's not going to change between, you know, a rat taking cocaine and a human. But the receptors with which it'll interact, dopamine receptors, um, uh, will be slightly different, uh, serotonin receptors as well, um, between the two organisms. So, and so it is important. And I say slight, I mean, I do mean slightly different. Like they're, they're, they will look almost identical and they'll behave almost identically, but there are, um, you know, some minor differences in the, the amino acids that, that compose them that may render how a drug like cocaine interacts with these receptors um, different in rodents relative to humans. Uh, the mind is a wonderful thing. I couldn't agree more. 
Uh, what fruits can naturally give you dopamine? Well, believe it or not, essentially all fruits will give you some dopamine. It is why we like fruit. Um, and it is why uh, a lot of foods um, can be um, impossible to avoid uh, for some people, is that uh, essentially whenever somebody eats you know, a delicious food, it doesn't even have to be fruit, right? Any um, delicious food that you enjoy, um, you have like a small dose of what happens in the brain when you do cocaine uh, or when you do essentially any addictive drug. Um, you know, you can name essentially any drug that somebody does fun for fun, you know, um, voluntarily, and they, it will share this um, one neurobiological mechanism at a minimum, which is elevating dopamine release in a specific part of the brain, in a specific circuit in the brain, the mesolimbic dopaminergic circuit. And so when you eat, you know, my, one of my favorite fruits is, is apple, right? Um, sweet tango. I'm a sweet tango guy. So if you ever see a sweet tango apple, try it out. Um, Anything but Red Delicious. It's a, it's a travesty how, how widespread Red Delicious is. Awful, awful apple. But I love it, right? And I, I have a, a drawer in my free, a refrigerator full of apples, right? And so I'll, I'll probably eat one after we uh, conclude talking. My daughter also loves apples, uh, which is good. <laughs> so the reason that apples even came to mind is that um, when I consume this delicious fruit, a small amount of dopamine uh, uh, is is released. Like, oh, well, a small increase in the concentration of dopamine occurs. So, uh, depression effect of oxycontin cause perm chemical damage to neurons, causing permanent depression. Oh, that's an interesting um, way to, to phrase it. So, so so oxycontin for anybody that's not familiar is the brand name for oxycodone. Oxycodone is a very um, potent opioid. It's not the most potent opioid, but it's extremely potent relative to like morphine or um, like codeine. Um, in fact, funny enough, or uh, troublingly enough, it was initially marketed by Purdue Pharma as a less addictive alternative to the uh, uh, opioids that existed at that time. Uh, turns out that was not true, and it turns out that they actually knew it wasn't true at a certain point. But um, anyways, it's a highly addictive opioid. Opioids are arguably the most addictive family of drugs, uh, recreational drugs, um, you know, depending on the person, obviously. Um, and but it, it, what's interesting about opioids and what makes them both useful medications, uh, but also you know um, uh, potentially you know problematic, is that opioids themselves actually do not damage nervous system tissue. Right? Some drugs do. Methamphetamine can kill dopamine-producing neurons uh, via excitotoxicity. Right? Um, oh come on! No, that, that's that's a, that's patently not true. Um, so. Uh, I think I'm, we're gonna, yeah, okay. Um, that, that is just complete nonsense. Uh, we, we know a lot about the, the origin of, um, of oxycodone, uh, oxycodone, oxycontin, and it's just what he's saying is false. Um, okay, so, uh, right, so opioids do not damage neurons themselves. Um, and that is different from like methamphetamine, which does, or even alcohol can damage uh, uh, neurons. Um, and so, uh, so that's intriguing. So uh, at a minimum, addictive properties of a drug do not rely upon damage to the brain, right? Um, so, but what opioids do, uh, do do, and very effectively at that, is alter the activities of specific groups of neurons, which is what drives, for some people, um, uh, that compulsive consumption, that, that addiction. Um, so, uh, and those changes, right, that, that occur over the course of, of using opioids for an extended period of time can last for a, a long time. In fact, some of those changes, there are some evidence to suggest they may be, for all intents and purposes, permanent, like epigenetic changes that can occur. Um, but by and large, the changes that occur in the brain um, are, trans they, they, they are not permanent from, from opioids, and so, that that is a source of optimism for you know recovery from opioid addiction. Like you're you know clearly um, you know you're you're referring to one of the most um, uh, devastating symptoms of opioid addiction and, and withdrawal, which is severe severe depression. And it's like it's a kind of depression that like you know um, rattles you to your core, right? It's not like the kind of depression that people who are withdrawing from cocaine experience, because cocaine has a very specific sort of um, uh, pharmacological activity in the, in the brain. 
the places that opioids uh, interact with are like also involved in things like maternal attachment, like a mother's love for her child, you know? And, and so when, you, when you're manipulating those parts of the brain, that depression is really severe. Um, but there is hope. You know, neurons have not been uh, irreparably uh, uh, damaged. They're just behaving differently for a period of time. And you know, it'll take a while to recover, but the process of that recovery, once you get to the point where you're no longer you know, um, compulsively thinking about opioids, constantly seeking them, that process is determined by how long it takes for the brain to come back to resembling something that looks normal. So, um, so there, there is hope, uh, particularly you know, if, if you're um, going through an opioid withdrawal, there is hope. Um, it is a very, very difficult thing to, to treat um, and to, to you know, endure, but people make it through. And um, you know, just um, best of luck if, if you're dealing with it or if somebody that, that you love is dealing with it. What is the best complement or drugs against Alzheimer's dementia currently? You know, there aren't really any treatments that are like cures. Um, and there have been a few interesting attempts in the not too distant past um, to devise drugs, treatments that do actually attack what we think is the sort of foundation of the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, which is to clear away those, those aggregates, that gunk that builds up, that causes, a re that at least it's very closely associated with Alzheimer's disease, amyloid beta plaque neurofibrillary tangles. Um, unfortunately, they haven't been very effective. So essentially, all treatments for Alzheimer's are what we call palliative. So meaning that they just lighten the, the, the severity of the symptoms of, of Alzheimer's disease. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, th there are some alternatives that are being explored now, but, um, but yeah, is it true marijuana slows it? Um, you know, I think you're referring to like some, some studies that, um, no, n you know, I, I, I could only speculate actually as to what you're referring to. Um, like the claims that can cannabinoids are anti-inflammatory and there is a theory that Alzheimer's disease doesn't arise directly actually from the amyloid beta plaques and neurofibrillary tangles but rather the, inflama the inflammatory activity that occurs as a byproduct of them being there and so anything that's in anti-inflammatory may um, you know um, uh, sort of uh, uh, alter the trajectory of that uh, dementia but there's no evidence that like cannabis or, or cannabinoids have any kind of like you know, therapeutic effect that is significant uh, with regards to, um, to Alzheimer's dementia. Um, all right. Okay. Oh, yes, that's it. You know, oh, yeah, awesome. I'm glad to hear it. No smarter than you, though, uh, I assure you. Okay, so we are connected to somebody. Uh, uh, what's that? Sorry? I'm good. Uh, what's your name and where are you calling from? Mohammed, okay. And where are you calling from? I'm from Kuwait. From Kuwait. All right. Uh, what's on your mind, man? Yes. So, I don't know. Uh, what are you talking about? Well, anything related to the brain. So, um, you know, if you have questions about dreams, about memory, um, or anything like that. So, when you think of something, you can uh, you can call back in. Um, okay. It's just a little, like, uh, noisy in the background there. Um, okay. Are you speaking from experience? Sounds like it. Uh, what effect uh, uh, does meditation have on the brain? Oh, and thank you so much, Sashi Mona Lisa. I appreciate it. Um, I can actually hear her in the in the background. <laughs> uh, what effect does meditation have on the brain? So um, a lot, actually. Um, so you know, it, it's sort of important because like there are different kinds of of uh, meditation, of course, right? And generally speaking, when you know in neuroscience we're talking about meditation, we're generally referring specifically to um, to uh, like mindfulness meditation uh, or like transcendental meditation is sort of like a form of mindfulness meditation. And this is kind of separate from some of the other uh, uh, traditions, let's say. Um, and yeah, there have been studies that, that do, I think I did a podcast on, I meant not, um, that do assess like changes in patterns of brain activity um, among people who followed some sort of specific mindfulness meditation regimen. Um, uh, over time relative to people who didn't or, or did some other kind of regular activity like yoga or something like that. Um, excuse me. And so, you know, broadly speaking, I, I wish I, I had uh, those notes in front of me because it's been a while since I thought about this, but broadly speaking, like there have been detectable changes in what we call functional connectivity, meaning when this part of the brain is active, this other part of the brain either becomes more or less active uh, as a, you know, uh, in rapid succession, which kind of implies that by some way they're communicating with one another. You know, um, it's sort of like 
uh, you know, if you're in a room and there's multiple lights and some of the lights are able to be, you know, lamps or whatever, some of those lamps can be turned on by flipping a switch, whereas other ones can't, right? You can tell which ones are connected to the switch by flipping on the switch, right? Um, okay, so, uh, so there's that, that there are these sort of broad, detectable, um, fairly consistent changes in how brain regions interact with one another. Um, so that's good. Another, th there have been studies that show uh, reduced circulating levels of glucocorticoids like cortisol. That's perhaps not particularly surprising. I mean, it, and cortisol is sort of like one of those, it's, it's, hard, it's hard for me to convey this to you, but it's, it's like, it's one of those molecules that is involved in so many things, um, but it's just for, for, you know, a pretty good reason. It, its reputation is basically like, a related to stress. When you're in, in stressful circumstances, you know, some sort of environmental external challenge, um, cortisol levels will increase. Um, as a, It's sort of one component of like a fight or flight reaction. Um, and so, and, and people who are chronically stressed um, or, you know, uh, are diagnosed with like generalized anxiety disorder tend to have elevated levels of cortisol. And it turns out that mindfulness meditation for, I, I can't, I think it was like six weeks or something like that resulted in consistently lower levels of um, of uh, average, you know, levels of cortisol in the, the meditation group. Um, there's also a study, I think at Johns Hopkins, um, that evaluated for people who are diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, um, diagnosed with it. So like not, not people who like, oh, I'm a fairly anxious person, but like some therapist, some psychiatrist or whatever has said like, yes, you have generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, it turned out that if those folks did mindfulness meditation, they tended to uh, report uh, uh, improvements in their uh, psychiatric states. Um, so there are a handful. I I'm a big proponent of mindfulness meditation. I think it's fabulous. Um, and there are free resources out there. So if you're trying to learn, go ahead and, and uh, give it a shot. Uh, you know, I can give you some uh, in the near future. So Tiger Bad Boy, uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, my name is John. I'm calling from Toronto, Canada. Awesome. John in Toronto. What's on your mind? Thanks, I appreciate uh, it. Yeah, man, yeah, I watch you all the time, man. Hardly ever. First time calling in. So, my wife and I over here, we just had a little discussion. Uh, is there any evidence that any race of people are smarter than others? Like, John, is, uh, called, I don't want to be politically incorrect, but you know what I mean. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, so, um, so. It's, it's a complicated uh, uh, topic because, of course, you have to define intelligence. Human intelligence is very, very complicated. Um, we have some tools to measure, like, how, you know, how do you measure intelligence? Um, is somebody who has just had a ton of education um, more intelligent than somebody who might be, you know, objectively smarter, um, who just hasn't had any education? You know, would you consider that to be more or less intelligent, right? Um, and, and of course, you know, we, a lot of people would refer to the IQ test, right? Um, which is a, a useful uh, tool to, to sort of measure certain parts of intelligence, but nobody will, or very few people would argue that it is a perfect yardstick for intelligence. It measures some parts of intelligence. Okay, so it, let's just restrict our conversation to that, right? To, to just how do different groups score on IQ tests? Yes, there is evidence that typically, you know, generally speaking, members of some groups will tend to, you know, uh, 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 stratify. Um, but, you know, what, what's important to always keep in mind is, first of all, um, you know, there are, the, the IQ test does not test for, like, that person who is, would otherwise be brilliant, but never went to school, never was educated. You know, you have to have some of that education to be able to score well on the IQ test. You don't have to be like a college professor or anything, but okay, so there's that. The other thing is that is how you're conceiving of race. Um, and so, you know, I'm by no means like a racial scholar, but um, if, you know, there have been scientists that, you know, have asked the question, okay, if race is a thing, if it's really a thing, there should be some biological you know, way to describe a race. Like, you know, do uh, if right. for all the people that we're referring to as white, you know, they must have some consistent biological difference that distinguishes them from all the people we call black or Asian or whatever. Um, and there's just no genetic evidence that supports that claim. And in fact, quite the opposite. Um, and I could go on and on, right, about like, for example, uh, in terms of how we conceive of race, we actually tend to rely on features of our genetics or genomes that do not indicate 
that there's a significant genetic difference. Like we, you know, we use skin color, right? That's like the major one that we use. And that is just like one, you know, that's not a very complicated set of genes. And generally speaking, you know, how light your skin is. Or <laughs> I feel your pain. <laughs> uh, so, oh, you know, and, and by the way, the, 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 there's one more thing that I, th- I just think it is a fascinating little factoid is that on the continent of Africa, Africa is a gigantic continent, right? It turns out there, there is greater genetic diversity between all the inhabitants of all the countries in Africa than there is among the rest of the world, right? right. Um, and, but in America, and I suppose probably also Canada, everybody from Africa would be called black, right? They're all just, <laughs> and so, so yeah. yeah. Go, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so nobody's ever explained it like that. This is very interesting that there is no real race, you could say, because we all came, we're all human. Is that kind of what, what you're saying? Yeah, but it's, it, essentially, like, it, it's it's more that, like, there are genetic differences, for sure, right? Uh, obviously, right? right? Uh, you know, generally right. speaking, people who are Asian tend to have a certain, you know, uh, a facial architecture that is more similar to each other than, than to me, right? Um, yes. But what that doesn't indicate is that there is a consistent, apart from that, right, that there's a consistent genetic difference between, you know, neurons, between other aspects of, of the body that can be consistently identified. Um, if you want to read, if you want, I'll, I'll just, I'll finish up on this. If you want to read somebody, that, if you want to read somebody that I think is, is, does the best biological work on this question, there's a scientist in North Carolina named Joseph Graves. Um, and he has some stuff, I think, on a website where he describes this more articulately than I ever could. Uh, but yeah, that, that is essentially the, the, the idea. Yeah. Right, right. So, okay, so the, why, is, why do we use the IQ test? Is, so wouldn't, wouldn't we say that the IQ test is a measure of education, not of genetic smarts then? Well, you know, so, so the IQ test yeah. arose a long time ago. Um, yeah. And it, it certainly arose before there was like a really robust and sophisticated neuroscience. Um, and absolutely, the proponents of the IQ test, and there are some who still hold fast, they would argue that no, actually, the IQ test, uh, and they use a lot of socioeconomic arguments for this, very accurately identifies somebody's in, inherent intelligence. Um, and okay. you know they'll they'll use facts like like this where somebody's IQ at, at beyond a certain age it really doesn't change very much as they get older. Um, okay. uh, it, it's it's really difficult to like you know bump up your IQ score uh, by by doing some kind of you know exercise or, or something. Um, and so, but you know I think the vast majority of people who confront this question like what what it, what exactly is the IQ test for? They would all identify that they're there is enough socioeconomic um, and historical sort of influence over how somebody, everything that happened to a person before they sat down to take that test is, is at, at least as important um, as you know, the genes that they've inherited. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess this, in short, it's because we, we sort of misunderstand what the IQ test is for, um, but, but also, Intelligence is one of the, the most difficult things to understand from a scientific perspective, let alone, you know, like a, an economic perspective. Um, so so that, that would be why I think. <laughs> no, thank you very much. That's a lot to take in for one day. You gave me a whole, uh, 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 I think, one year of psychology. Uh, <laughs> <or, laughs> well, it was my pleasure, man. Uh, I, I appreciate you calling in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop down. I'll keep listening to you. Sounds good, man. Uh, great to talk to you. All right. Um, yeah, classic, classic topic. Um, but I, I always, I, I love an opportunity to discuss that because it is definitely one of those things that influences, I think, a lot of people's worldviews. Um, but there is just the, these sort of simple misunderstandings. Oh, another person I should bring up is Elliot Tucker Drob. He's at, I always forget, I think he's at Duke now, like Duke or Emory. Oh, no, I think he's at UT Austin now. Um, he is, I think, also does some of the best research on like intelligent, the relationships between intelligence, genetics, neuroscience, and, and stuff like that. So, um, Elliot Tucker Drob, uh, check, check, check him out. Check, 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 check him out. <laughs> um, all right. Oh, sorry, man. Uh, feel free to call back in. I guess I don't know if you're a man, but um, feel free to call back in. I can prevent dying. That's all the smarts I need. Yeah, right. Well, I mean. 
you know, there, there is like, like we, we are sort of like a novel evolutionary experiment, right? Hum, humans in our sort of, you know, con, modern form haven't really existed for very long relative to the, you know, evolution of other organisms. So human intelligence, particularly like concurrent human intelligence, hasn't really existed for barely any time at all, right? It has barely existed. Um, and so it is sort of an ongoing experiment as to whether or not human intelligence is actually evolutionarily uh, advantageous. It might be that we're, you know, we're smart enough to build beautiful, you know, skyscrapers and write beautiful art, but we're not smart enough to prevent ourselves from killing ourselves, right? You know, we can make the atomic bomb, but knowing how to use the atomic bomb is at least just as important, right? Um, so uh, so I, I'm an optimist when it comes to human intelligence. I think we, uh, we will prove that uh, natural selection uh, favors human intelligence, but it has yet to be uh, determined. <laughs> um, all right. So there's discrepancies between performance and abilities. Um, all right. Uh, faster than the speed of light, Einstein said it's impossible. Yeah, I mean, I, I would trust him. <laughs> um, more than I would trust me, I should say. Children, yes. Uh, IQ uh, was designed to diagnose learning disabilities among children. It's now misconstrued. Yeah, I, I, so I, I remember reading about like the origins of the IQ test a long time ago because I had years ago, maybe like three or four years ago, I had... I had wanted to do a podcast episode on intelligence, and particularly because there was this this debate that emerged after a guy named Sam Harris had a guy named Charles Murray on his podcast, um, and um, I ended up focusing more on. And Charles Murray wrote a, a very sort of notorious, or he co-wrote a very notorious book called The Bell Curve, and he he a part of the book relies heavily on IQ tests, um, and um, I didn't know anything about him uh, apart from that book. Um, and you know it, it's a very divisive book, uh, the uh, the bell curve. Um, so Sam Harris and, and he's been sort of um, he's a pariah essentially because of a lot of the claims he made in that book. Um, and uh, and so Sam Harris, who has a very very prominent podcast, uh, he's very well. He's a you know very successful writer. He has a background in, in neuroscience. Um, he invited uh, Charles Murray on and had a conversation about this. Um, about race and IQ, essentially, and um, you know, he—they were both pilloried for it because, um, just because, like, like there, there just wasn't a sophisticated appreciation for the the latest research that complicates this conversation, uh, specifically from people like Elliot Tucker Drob. Like, like for example, you know, one of the lines of evidence that is used by people who are proponents of using the IQ test to, to you know, determine intelligence um, is that if you have identical twins and they're separated at birth, their IQs will be very, very similar. Well, Elliot Tucker Drob shows actually that's not the case. Um, so uh, uh, so in, in any case, uh, uh, that's why I got into this. And so I ended up focusing a little bit too much on Charles Murray back Charles Murray's background, which by the way, if you're not familiar with that uh, abyss, you might find it super interesting. Uh, I think you know. I, I my bet is that Sam Harris didn't even know like who Charles Murray was. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, I probably neglected reading about the the origins of the IQ test as a result, and then I ended up just saying like I can't do this. Like this is such a gigantic topic, I just cannot do this while I'm still trying to finish my PhD, right? Um, so yeah, I'll have to uh, spend some time learning more about that origin, or those origins. Yeah, I think it was. Well, in any case, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Can we unite both sides into one? Uh, I don't know what you mean by that. Um, are we alone in the universe? Oh, you know, I was talking to Euro Maestro, actually. I was chatting with him, and uh, we were talking about, like, you know, he, uh, he collaborating with a group on, um, on COVID-19. Uh, and, you know, we were just talking about, you know, our understandings of, like, how we got to where we are and, and that kind of thing. And then, you know, I, I just, like, randomly brought up, like, yeah, so much has happened. It feels like it's been, you know, like it's already been like five years within the past, you know, few months. Um, and but of course, you know, you know, hopefully the, the rest of 2020 will, will, will look better, uh, except I'm sure like next week we'll be inv invaded by aliens and, you know, they'll enslave us. Uh, and he like he did this like uh, and I'm sure he, he like uh, was was essentially quoting somebody else who's done it, another scientist. But he basically said, like, the probability is not as low as you think, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Um, all right. 
how do we get rid of obsessive thoughts? It's tough. I think uh, Harris noticed Murray after his talk was canceled at the university. Of, was it Michigan? I thought it was like, I thought it was um, like Oberlin or something like that. In any case, yeah, right. Um, w- yeah, which is, it's, well, in any case, I mean, we can have a whole conversation about Charles Murray, but um, suffice it to say that, that I do not find the arguments that uh, Charles Murray made in that interview, nor that I've seen him made elsewhere, uh, very convincing at all. Uh, it, it's like, it, it's, it's, he's purely using socioeconomics to, with IQ and just making the assumption that IQ is a, almost a biological measure. Um, and it's just, that's a very unsophisticated argument. That, like, I, I can, you could justify making that argument 50 years ago, <laughs> right? Before we had, like, a, you know, genome sequencing and, like, very sophisticated sort of psych- psychological statistical methods and, you know, genetics, behavioral uh, profiling, you know, these types of things. An understanding of the relationship between socioeconomic status and neuro- uh, neurophysiological health. Like, we, all of those things. Uh, but we have those now. <laughs> so it's just, I think it's just, you can't justify it. Uh, there's an ideological commitment there uh, with Charles Murray, uh, I think is, that, that, that's where, well, how I'll put it. Um, how do we get rid of obsessive thoughts? Um, so it, it's difficult. So first of all, if, you, are you, if you're having recurring obsessive thoughts, um, that, is, that could be a psychiatric condition that could be recognized by a, a, a therapist or a psychiatrist. You know, if, if you just cannot stop, I mean, that is a symptom of obsessive compulsive disorder is rumination, you know, um, you know, being obsessed over more, most frequently it's, it's like negative, potential negative events, um, you know, ruminating over some anticipated doom. Um, and, and then the other, well, one of the other parts of OCD is that um, an inappropriate behavior is then associated with the attempt to mitigate that anxiety, right? So you end up washing your hands super excessively. By the way, I can't imagine what it's like for people whose OCD manifests in like excessive hand washing. That, that is like a category of OCD. I can't imagine what life is like now where they're like, all of a sudden they have like a superpower. <laughs> they're like, they're super prepared to deal with this pandemic. Um, uh, you know, but that, that is a it's a very small silver lining, I would imagine. Just like, my hands are always so dry. My knuckles, I'm constantly having to put lotion on them. It's like brutal. Um, anyways, uh, so there are some pharmacological me- me- mechanisms or, or tools uh, available that could help to mitigate the recurrence of that uh, uh, perseveration or of that um, um, you know, rumination, of those obsessive cyclical thoughts. Um, Generally speaking, you know, they're, they're sort of, a lot of them are like in the sort of antidepressant or antipsychotic classes, um, atypical antipsychotics. Uh, there's that. Um, there's also just like therapy, you know. Um, it, it, you, don't, you don't need to rely upon pharmacology to uh, confront the brain. You know, we have people who train to, to help you do that. Um, and so that would be, you know, what I would recommend. Particularly, I mean, if you're just like concerned that like, Oh, it's sort of borderline. It doesn't really affect my life. You know, I just, I wish I didn't do it so much. That's, you know, I, I feel like that, that's maybe closer to normal, right? Um, but if it's inf- influencing, to, you know, reducing your quality of life, that's, that's a different story. Um, and you should reach out to a physician. Um, all right. You ever do any DMT? You know, um, gosh, I keep forgetting to get this quote of um, Thomas uh, Metzinger, I think is his name. Ah, oh, God, that is so frustrating. I thought I had it. Ah. Well, uh, I'll put it the way he put it, where if you're interested in exploring uh, consciousness, um, there are some people who are like serious about understanding consciousness and some people who are sort of like um, entrepreneurs <laughs> in trying to understand uh, consciousness. And you're either serious about it or you're not. Uh, that's my answer. Okay. Have schizophrenic symptoms ever gone away in someone with schizophrenia? Well, sure. Um, so, uh, at following treatment. So, generally speaking, it is, uh, you know, there are like sort of different types of symptoms of schizophrenia. So schizophrenia can manifest in different ways. Um, 
but generally speaking, we you know refer to like the positive symptoms or the negative symptoms. Positive symptoms are like the acquired ca- uh, characteristics of schizophrenia, like you know uh, paranoia is one of the, the frequent ones. But there can also be like hallucinations. Uh, most frequently, it's auditory hallucinations, but not not exclusively. It can also be visual. Um, so so there's that. But then there's also like negative symptoms where you know people um, have what we refer to as like a, a flattened affect, uh, where they just don't sort of like broadcast their emotional states to others as most people do. Um, so, and, and most treatments that we have for schizophrenia are, um, are effective at treating the, the positive uh, symptoms. Um, but there's also like, you know, social anxiety can be, can be a component of schizophrenia. Um, and, uh, and so uh, derealization, you know, um, there's, you know, typically like, uh, unconventional beliefs uh, are, are sort of common to it. Um, and, you know, so all this, today, we have some uh, treatments that are effective for some symptoms of schizophrenia, not others. Um, for, so, and, and those symptoms can abate at following effective treatment. Not all of them, but some of them. Now, what you may be more interested in is psychosis, right? If, if somebody has a bout of psychosis, uh, which it's actually quite a bit more common than I expected, um, they are, uh, uh, it happens more frequently in more people's lives than I anticipated. Um, that is an acute uh, experience, right? It, it, it's there, you're experiencing psychosis, you can be hallucinating, you can be extraordinarily paranoid, um, you can be obviously extremely um, anxious, but then after whatever precipitated the, the um, bout of psychosis um, uh, is, you know, gone <laughs> uh, or is mitigated, um, this psychosis uh, uh, terminates, right? So, like, you know, oh, oh, there we go. Looks like I was just kicked. I think there was something wrong with that entire stream. Um, there was like very few people in it. All right, well, um, I should just probably call it a day anyway. So, thanks for watching, everybody. Um, you can see my Twitter handle at the bottom there. It's the best way to reach out if you see something hear something, want to talk about something. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Oh, and, and if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, I would appreciate it if you would, if you enjoy what you see and you know recommend topics. Um, I was going to talk about that, uh, the question about a uh, head injury, but um, um, perhaps it will come up another day. I'm surprised it didn't. Um, so yeah, uh, hit subscribe uh, if, if you're interested. Um, thanks for watching, everybody. Have a great um, Sunday. Have a great Father's Day. See you guys.